do it. Um, all right, so this is home for me. Uh, 504 is the area code at New Orleans. This is very much me just talking to you. Uh, a few uh, ground rules. One, uh, if we're going to talk about changing education and changing the way schooling is done, then I'm going to challenge some of the conventions. If I just stand up here and talk at you for an hour about the future of school and don't acknowledge that I just did nothing to change the st sage on the stage construct of school, I should be run off. Right? So I'm going to make you stand up and do some stuff that's maybe slightly uncomfortable, but I promise it will be fun. And I promise that you walk out of here at least saying you were part of thinking about what the future of school is. Because frankly, if as adults we aren't thinking about challenging traditional notions of school, and we don't do more to do that ourselves and model that for our kids, it will mean nothing when we tell them to rethink school. Because day after day after day, kids show up in schools that were designed 100 years ago, in buildings that were designed to look like factories that were built 100 years ago. And there's really been very little rigorous dialogue about what school could be in our country. And that's what New Orleans, by virtue of necessity and tragedy, uh, has had to confront. And it's pretty exciting what is happening now in that discussion. So um, this is very much that. I'm going to pause twice for some non mac talking at you stuff and try to get it done early enough so that we can have a dialogue, okay? So that's, that's uh, so let me start with some data, and, and if you aren't familiar with um, the state of affairs in U.S. education, this is some results from a McKinsey study from last year. I'll read it to you if you're having trouble seeing it. This is a survey of teachers on the left, kids and employers on the right. The question was this, how well does school prepare you for the jobs that are out in the world? And educators thought they were doing a really good job of that. And kids and employers themselves had a slightly, I would argue, dramatically different take. This is one way to illustrate what I mean when I say that schooling in the U.S. is not broken, it's obsolete. And I spent 20 years of my career, everything that didn't include working for AD, trying to fix broken schools. And I was part of a career a movement of people in school reform trying to fix something that somebody else broke. And it's only in the last five or six years that I've realized I had the problem wrong the whole time. This is not about some other person breaking school and us being the righteous fixers of school. This is about a hundred year decline in our rigorous dialogue about what the purpose of school is. School is now obsolete and the folks that live in it have a very obsolete view of the world. And there's some dramatic data about it. Here's some other data. This is from uh, the only real rigorous international study of school performance. This is data about 15 year olds. The gray line is an average of all of the OECD first world and some emerging countries, 65 countries. That's their average performance of their 15 year olds over the last decade. The blue line is the United States of America. Out of 65 countries, our 15-year-olds are ranked 36th in science, 28th in math, and our strong suit of reading, we bring home the 24th place trophy. I'm just going to give you 30 seconds to talk as a table, and I want one vote per table about what you think the orange line is. Go. Go. <laughs> Fifteen seconds. It could be All right. How about it? You guys got a vote? Say China. China. Nope. How about it? Poland. Uh, yeah. Lynn nailed it. Poland. What was your vote? New Orleans. New Orleans. No. What was your vote? China. China. They, South Korea. South Korea. Good guess. South Korea is actually number one in math and second or third in science. They kick our button problem solving too. So Poland, right? 
when I was a kid, I was taught lots of Polish jokes. And this is tragic, right? Like, they should be writing jokes about us now. Right? I mean, and that's the ridiculous part, right? Like, we live in a country where we, we still think it's hilarious to tell jokes about those guys. They were kicking our ass in 2003. Yeah. And this is the naivete, right? We need to open our eyes that in the U.S. we think we're golden. And there are other countries where the kids are fighting for their lives and they are winning. Here's some of those devastating uh, framing of this data that I've ever seen. Amanda Ripley wrote a book last year called The Smartest Kids in the World. Put it on your list. It sounds like Glenn has already read it. Um, the only reason I got it. Well played. Okay. Um, this is what our country would look like if we were competing state by state in the same competition. So we'd be tied with Russia, where I live, uh, Louisiana, Serbia, or our counterparts. And you can see that there is actually only one state in blue, and they're competing with Canada. If you took Massachusetts and it competed with the rest of the world, it would do quite well. And you know why? It's because in 1983, when Reagan commissioned A Nation at Risk, the people in Massachusetts read the damn thing and did something about it. And they raised their standards higher than any other state. And they've been working at this for 25 years, and it is working. There's another way Amanda looks at the data, even more devastating data. There's a survey that uh, OECD put out for the same group of kids, asking them about creative problem solving and character development. And this is maybe a little hard to track, but Korean kids were by far the most resilient, the toughest, the ones that went back to tough problems faster, the kids that kept getting after it. And you see how far we are over there? On this status, we're about 20, our kids are, according to this data, which I can talk to you about in more detail if you want to know, our kids are half as resilient as Korean kids. In the late 80s, Car and Driver came out with another version of the Mustang, and they thought it would be funny to do a road test of a Mustang versus an actual Mustang. 223 horsepower on the right, one horsepower on the left. This is my perspective on what's happening in the global fight, the global race. We are still riding a damn horse. And we are having arguments about whether we should change the color of the saddle or whether we should use a different type of leather for our harness. When every other country is building rockets and cars, and things that move much faster. And so this to me is an argument for not talking about reforming our schools, but reinventing them. Innovating and trying to start thinking about what school really is for uh, in a modern age. Another great book, Stephen Johnson wrote uh, this book called Where Do Good Ideas Come From? Uh, and I'll, I'll include a link to it for you later. Uh, he talked about where communities, he studied over the last 200 years, moments in history where great innovation happened. He studied what happened in Florence. He studied what happened in, uh, the, in the Enlightenment. Uh, he studied what happened when the Medici's got a lot of people around. He studied the coffee houses of uh, Paris. He studied uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And what he found was that there was a culture that allowed people to share their half-baked, not perfect ideas of what the future could be with other people who would also share their feedback on that stuff. So he has a really uh, a magnificent uh, summary of this research where he says, innovation happens when you let culture develop to a point that you share your half-hunch and I share my half-hunch and we build off of one another's so half-hunches to create a community of trust and innovation where it is okay to fail. It's okay to look like a fool because you haven't figured it out, but you're going to put your idea out there in front of the group and get feedback. And that's the antithesis of the way we've looked at education. And it's the antithesis of the way I felt as a teacher and as a principal and even as a district official.
that I was not encouraged to share my questions or uncertainties because the kids' lives were at stake. I had to have the answer to every single question. And if you ask a classroom teacher today, that's the way they feel. The pressure to serve these kids out of pure nobility and purpose creates a culture that stagnates and discourages innovation. And at the core, that's what we're trying to change in the mindset and the culture of our schools. So we're going to do it together right now. So what I want you to do is stand up if you could. I've given you a headband. If you're worried about this, you can take your headband. There's also some wristbands. I'm going to put mine on you. I'm going to put yours on. That's good for you. All right. Put it on. Put your headband on. Here we go. All right. We're going to have this. The, the goal here is one, for you to just engage someone you haven't met. Two, watch what happens when we as a community commit to changing the cultural vibe, right? The cultural vibe of this event was get some food, sit down, meet some people around you, walk out. No one's going to make me look like a fool. I'm sorry. But, but watch what we're about to do. You're going to feel connected to the people around the room, unlike any... Thank you for putting the headbands on, by the way. This is like, great. I really was not expecting that many headbands. Wristbands, go for it. If, you're, if you don't want to mess up your due, some people actually put more money into their hair than I do, just double up that headband and make it a wristband. You can also make it a beer koozie if you'd like, if you brought a beer. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to partner up, and you're going to play a two out of three round of rock, paper, scissors. Okay? Now, think about your strategy now. Very good. Right? At the end of that game, okay, you're going to go two. Here, we, let's just agree. We're going to go one, two, three, and then shoot. Okay, I don't want to have the whole argument about, well, it was... We're supposed to go on three. We're just gonna go one, two, three, shoot, okay? And then you play three rounds, okay, with your partner. Here's the, here's the only rule: if you get beat, you suddenly transform into the most die-hard fan of the person that just beat you, because they're gonna go find someone who just won their round, and they're gonna go head to head. And so the second round of this will have two people going head to head, and two cheerleaders standing right next to them, one cheering for one and one cheering for the other, even though they just lost to that person. All right? And then they're going to go again, and then you're going to go to a next round, and you're going to have three people cheering for you, and that person is going to have three people cheering for them. And it's going to get louder and louder and louder, and at the end there's going to be some brawl right here in the middle with the two finalists, and there's going to be a champion. Why do you do that? Okay? Ready? All right, so partner up. Get your partner. I'm going to tell you when. All right, this is going to take less than a minute. Ready? Go. One, two, three.
Hey, You're the man! Okay, y'all are like where's your y'all are like a four out of ten on the cheering. Like, look at all this space. Like, come in here and support the man. All right, all right. I want some. I want the roof to come off. Okay. Okay. Let's 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 hear it. Let's get the money out. The championship. Who here is cheering for Kyle Wingfield? The Rock's yes, brought me that here here is here is the Rock's good. Rock's good. <laughs> well played. Well played. Do that still, right? Well played. Thank you. So how does that, I want to say, if you have an insight. Which cover is going left? How does that feel? How, how did that feel? Anybody want to share an observation of what it felt? It's going to break through Fun. the wall. Fun. Anybody? Joel said epic. There was a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> Is that going to be on YouTube? You're just magic balls. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's... The kids, are, the kids are feeling the same thing. That it's hard to focus when uh, when there's a lot of noise? That's a great question, right? So one of these norms. Our assumption is quiet classrooms are good. Much of the data suggests that loud classrooms are actually better when structured correctly. Chaos, bad. But uh, amazing, actually, some of the schools I've seen in the last few years, how much louder they were than I, than I was used to as a teacher. Here. No, I'll say I really wanted to win, and then I really wanted my guy to win. Dude, so that break, Eric just summed up what Johnson's research proved out, is that cultures that give people a sense of pride about participating, right, that Eric was able, that is a cultural norm that Eric just described, that he is willing to be passionate about winning himself and put it out there. And as soon as he fails, he is now supporting the other people around him. And I'm not doing, this is not just, I'm not just trying to be all cheery and isn't it neat and let's all cheer for each other and cheer for teachers. I'm talking about just demonstrating to ourselves what it's like to change a culture, to change a mindset, right? And that's hard to do. But Johnson's research is really remarkable when you look into it, that this is statistically, innovation happens when you create this culture. And it includes a comfort with failure and a willingness to, to see a bigger picture. That the bigger picture here was not about who won the championship. I'm, I'm really proud of you guys, by the way, your finalists and everyone else. You did great. But, right, this is about uh, us trying to understand uh, how to restructure an entire um, culture. So these two organizations I've been involved with in New Orleans, I was the CEO at New Schools for New Orleans for three years and then I've been working on 4.0 for about three and a half. Um, and I'll explain what both of these are. Before I do, I want to give uh, the limited edition blue headband. That's right, limited edition to Matt Kirby, who is opening a charter school uh, this summer. I just wanted to tell you thank you, Matt, and congratulations. why I'm proud of Matt is because Matt's got a really successful career as an entrepreneur, but he had the guts to put it out there and say, I'm going to try and contribute. And I appreciate you for that, Matt. I and mean, we need more people putting it out there, okay? Because it's, it's, there's no magic bullet, right? Sorry, there's no, like, secret weapon from New Orleans that I'm bringing and I'm giving you the secret recipe. There isn't. It's this constant slog of people trying new things. Um, let me talk first about New Schools for New Orleans. Here's some data on New Orleans since the storm. In 2005, this is the student performance score. This is actually on a scale of zero to 200, right? So at pre-storm New Orleans, out of 200, scored 56.9. Since then, we have caught and passed where the state average was. This is, again, in seven years. You can see what's happened to the state average by pulling up its largest and lowest performing district. So we've contributed to the Louisiana performance. 
And we've now passed a couple of parishes, we call counties parishes in Louisiana, that for decades people were like, New Orleans better than those guys? Never. So we're not done yet, right? My colleague who runs New Schools for New Orleans now describes the progress in New Orleans as going from an F to a C. Now the question is how do we get from C to A? I think that's a good way to think about it. Here's a pretty even more powerful way to look at it. This is the percent of kids um, that are eligible for Louisiana's college uh, merit scholarship tops. So this is like practical numbers of how many more kids in Louisiana, in New Orleans in particular, the Green Line, only 25% of kids who grew up in New Orleans were eligible for this scholarship. That number's up to almost 40%. It's pretty dramatic. The role of New Schools for New Orleans has been very much to look at the school system in New Orleans as a portfolio, the same way you would as an investment portfolio. Maximize returns on the most profitable and useful school models and minimize the pain of the most uh, unsuccessful ones. So they have lots of grant and policy uh, engagement with work where they shut down the weakest schools. And this is not relying on the authorizer or the district. So if I was working in Georgia and Fitz was a superintendent, Fitz could trust that I, as an active member of that charter portfolio, would be self-policing. The charter portfolio in Louisiana self-polices, and we get our own out of business before Fitz has to get in and do it. Because we will hold people accountable. If you step up and say, I'm going to be a charter school operator, and you suck, you're, we're going to be there before the guys with the badges are. And that's important. Because if we don't self-police, then this is just another stupid policy, silver bullet thing. Um, the other thing that uh, we used to refer to New Schools from New Orleans as kind of a harbor master. So we would take the best stuff in the country and import it. And the last six years has very much been based on that strategy. The very best models in the, in the country felt like New Orleans was a place they could come, get the support they needed. When I ran school development at KIPP, we talked about the three Fs, freedom, facilities, uh, and finance. And we did all three of those very well in Louisiana. So if you wanted to charter, start a school there or bring your charter operator uh, to New Orleans, those boxes were going to be checked. But that's only part of it, right? That's really part of what, how, one way to manage the existing portfolio. In New Orleans now, we have 90% of kids in charter schools, by the way, today. 4.0 is a different beast, and it is more focused on looking forward. We're trying to develop entrepreneurial leadership, both attract it, but more importantly, build it from uh, within. And we're also trying to uh, start new schools uh, and new non-school startups. And what's been unique about the last three and a half years is that I now run with people who are in job and economic development more than I do school reform. We've successfully linked economic redevelopment and the creation of future jobs in New Orleans to the work of making our schools better. And that's a really powerful uh, feature of what's happening in New Orleans. So specifically, the way you go through this process from a hunch about making school better to launching a new school or startup at 4.0 is a sequence. Uh, we let you come hang out with people who've done it. They hear their stories. We give you a little bit of money and coaching on how to experiment in your own neighborhood or classroom. We'll then give you a three-month intensive course um, requiring you to be there every day with us in your face, coaching you, giving you feedback, making you get in front of parents and kids to see whether your school design or your other stuff, if it's a teaching development program, whatever it might be, is, is working. And then we'll give you low rent office space and make you hang out with us for up to 18 months while you put your new business or school online. A couple of just quick examples, Josh Denson, was the founding math teacher at KIPP in Harlem, and he had some kids, and that's him pitching in 2011 this weird idea about a, a school called New Orleans Academy, where it now manifests this summer as the most interesting, diverse, creative charter school in the, New Orleans called Bricolage, which is French for uh, putting stuff that you find around together in a creative new form. Uh, design thinking, the maker movement, kids coding from, K from kindergarten, all these things happen at Bricolage. And he went through that whole cycle. It was just a hunch, like a really kind of half-baked idea for a school. But we embraced him and gave him two years of ramp and coaching and support to turn that into a school. 
Nicole Jarbo was a teacher at the best uh, open enrollment high school in New Orleans, a school that we incubated when I worked at New Schools for New Orleans, and she was frustrated with how bad teacher professional development is. Who's ever been to a teacher PD session? Okay, The place where hope went to die, right? <laughs> Usually hosted like at 9 a.m. on a beautiful Saturday. Like, it's terrible. So Nicole... Uh, came up with the idea of taking CrossFit techniques and using these uh, highly interactive, like in-your-face techniques to coach teachers. And we've got lots of folks saying that because of things like Teacher Gym, they're staying in the profession longer because they're actually being developed as professionals. And that's, that's huge, right? That's hitting at one of the core issues of why schools aren't attracting our best talent. So far, 300 people like Josh and Nicole have come through our training. They've launched 25 ventures in school designs, and we've served, they're serving about 5,000 kids today. Some ideas for Atlanta, and uh, we'll be done by 9.15, and I'm, I'm sort of done with the storytelling. I want to generate some dialogue about these ideas. These are just a few ideas I have for Atlanta. One, I think you should be thinking about non-school startups. Who's been to a co-working facility in Atlanta? Anybody ever been to one? So the, more of you should go, because this is where a lot of the young tech companies in New Atlanta are being built today. Um, we, we opened an office in New York City in January, and we're based out of a co-working facility where all of the tech startups um, in Chelsea are built. Not all, but many. And it's really important to create a connection between your education entrepreneurs and your other entrepreneurs, because you don't need policy to launch a non-school startup. This is a $600 billion industry. There are plenty of business opportunities for folks to make things better for existing constituents. And you need to spend zero political capital on it. A 10% Skunk Works challenge. I've been talking with some national funders about putting pots of money together and saying to existing operators, for example, KIPP Foundation. KIPP runs some amazing schools in Atlanta. But what if funders got together and said, Kip and all of the other high-performing charters, I've got a pot of money here that you get access to if you commit to spending 5 10% of your budget on radical new versions of the Kip model. Genuinely building a skunk works within your program. Because if the best schools aren't innovating, why do we expect that schools that are struggling to innovate? And there are many funders that are not asking those high performers to innovate, they're only asking them to scale, to add more seats. And the reality is, right, is that there are huge diseconomies of scale. KIPP is now one of the biggest school districts in the country, but they have the disadvantage of operating those schools over 35 geographies. So, 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 so correct, you can actually create tremendous momentum uh, by taking your best folks and giving them a different sense beyond just scaling. Micro schools. If there's one school I'd love for you to look up and think about, it's a school called Acton Academy in Austin, Texas. I spent some time there last month, and I'm now in a long-term relationship with them, helping them scale their model. This is a $10,000 a year private school, 120 kids from K through 12, started by parents, and uh, people are moving from all over the country just to get a chance to sign up for this school. I have never seen student engagement higher than when I watched a group of 7th, 5th, 6th, 8th graders, all this class, no grade levels there, run the entire school day by themselves. Uh, remarkable school, what I think is the beginning of a movement that I'm calling micro schools. The costs of building schools and running them is going down, and this is, a, I think, a, a really interesting glimpse into the future. <clears throat> There's a group we work with it's called Startup Weekend. These are 54-hour weekend sessions to encourage people to think about new business or school ideas. We have a partnership with them. You can call these guys up, and they can run Startup Weekend EDU uh, in Atlanta in six months. Great way to sort of jumpstart that process of encouraging entrepreneurship and education. Uh, Village Capital is actually based here. Really great venture philanthropy shop. They're doing some super interesting uh, vertical-based incubation and uh, startup challenges all around the globe. Um, they're a great thought partner that's here ready to talk to you. And then student-led schools. Within a year, I'm going to run a uh, version of my three-month incubator dedicated to 18 to 23-year-olds. I want them to come to me and say, 
what do you want to build in a school? And I will give you the money and the support to start schools yourselves. Because every time I bring kids in, I never run a, I never give a money away in a competition unless kids and parents are on the judging panel. And it, every time I do it, I'm just constantly amazed. And this is what Amanda Ripley is so uh, cogent in communicating, is the research kids statistically are spot on when you ask them about deficiencies in schools. They go figure, because they're the customer, they know what's wrong. And you would be amazed at how rarely we actually ask them. Amanda did a quick a survey of press coverage of school issues over the last two years, 20% of journalists actually ask kids about stories related to education. Even, the media, we are, even in the media, we are misunderstanding. We're solving the wrong problem. We're trying to fix the bureaucracy instead of trying to design for our users. And if we put kids and families at the center there and we design for them, remarkable things happen, often much cheaper than we're thinking about when we're trying to fix the whole system. So that's uh, just a list of ideas. I'm going to respect the time and be done by 9.15. But let me just do this. Uh, I'll pause and just take some questions. Uh, on the web, and you can pull this up on your mobile phone, and I would really appreciate it. I can handle multitasking. So if you pull up your phone and type that into your browser, then that's actually a survey that will let you give me feedback, which I would love. You can also just email me or get me on Twitter or on Facebook as well. So my digits are there. I would love to talk to anyone following up. But let me just pause and use the rest of the time for Q&A. Kelly? I'll, I'll start off. George is at a decision point on its testing. We pulled out of the park tests, and, and now we're going to have to come up with an answer. What are you seeing are, in the, these ideas? Are people reinventing testing? We've been doing testing the same way for a long yeah. time, and we know we've got to keep score. But you know, competency-based learning and other kinds of ideas have come about. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I you know I think that the conversation about Common Core is a tremendous waste of energy. Um, we need uh, we need to test our kids, and yes, the, the the weight of all this crap on teachers is just getting heavier and heavier and heavier. It's really not fun to be a teacher anymore because of all the testing. But the the reality is, if we don't start raising standards. Uh, across the board nationally, we're gonna that map of the states is gonna get redder. So you know, I, I personally don't think uh, a lot of good friends who've been involved in building these tests, and um, I think it's misguided to say I'm pulling out a park and then I'm gonna build my own test because it's expensive, it's hard, it costs millions of dollars, and un inevitably over the last 30 years, what we've seen is the data has shown that there's actually a regression to the mean and people start lowering standards. And that's, that's to me, uh, unfortunate when a state so it says they're in the park. And Jindal's struggling with right now in Louisiana. The architect of some of the most aggressive school reform legislation in the country that I've been blown away by is now being pushed by his base on the right to scrap the test. I think it's a waste of energy. Um, I think we just gotta move on and be a state like Massachusetts who's like, this common core thing in Massachusetts doesn't even, it, like, you can't, it doesn't even make sense because their standards are above PARC and all the other consortium, the other two consortiums. Um, that's the way a state needs to be behaving if they want good educators and entrepreneurs to show up in, in town. Yeah. Did the uh, demographic is racial mix change after Katrina and New Orleans? Very little. Um, the city was about 67 to 68% African American, it was about 63 to 62 right now. Um, the white population has not changed that. The change there has mostly been an influx of Latinos, so up to about five to seven percent of the population. Tom. Matt, uh, when Narav was here speaking you know, yeah. a couple months ago, and, and your slide, uh, I think, verified this, the, the progress that New Orleans made, even going to the percentage of charter kids that they've got, was great in comparison to Louisiana, right. but but still well below. Yep. you know other norms and as an outside observer you know one might have thought that given the influx of really good charter schools there that those stats would have been a lot higher yeah what what what's the it's great insight what, what's great. off two things are, are going on one um, the, the, the depth of underperformance in these bottom states Mississippi Louisiana uh, 49th and 50th back and forth over decades was remarkable. Just the remediation. Just truly remarkable how far behind these kids really were. 
Uh, and the second is that I think as an architect of a lot of these schools over the last 15 years, uh, our schools designed for these kids are really good at getting them up to a baseline, but you know, to use a metaphor, the lemon has been squeezed of its juice in what we call no excuses charter schools, where we're focusing on math and English remediation. And in many ways, um, other states are, because they have more middle class families in the public school system, um, the, the, the air under the wings of more middle class families who are pursuing more progressive ideas is carrying a lot of other states. But you know, for New Orleans, for example, um, the, if you look, the middle class, black and white, does not go to school in public schools in, in Louisiana. And so I think what we're realizing is, and this is why Nerv and I are speaking so frequently about um, building new, new models and saying to our, guy, our friends at KIPP, you have brought that bar up as far as you can, but to move further and to move faster, and, and some of these guys are plateauing a little bit, uh, you've got to think about some more and engaging uh, curriculum designs. You have to personalize learning. Um, so blended is something that, blended learning is a term that we use to describe that, blending computer-based computer and teacher-based. But the only way to really make that jump, Tom, is to start thinking about serving each kid and pushing each kid. Because uh, thinking about the average, we've kind of not hit the ceiling, but it's flattening a little. Yeah. Uh School choice has not been exactly embraced by the unions and the associations and administrations in a lot of areas. Uh, how do you get past that with the innovation that the entrenched? Yeah, uh, so that's a great question, and that's one of the most interesting things I think I've learned in the last three and a half years is when I, if I talk consistently about serving kids and parents, guess what? Labor leadership is is on board with me because. I can build a school like Acton or like Bricolage, or I can encourage a classroom teacher like Nicole Jarbo to start a company that helps other teachers, and suddenly I'm not, you know, fighting them on these principles of choice and the, the bigger management labor dialogue about control in the system. So done well, a play on innovation actually completely minimizes labor pushback because you're engaging their members to be entrepreneurs. And I've never, you know, and that's really been a very effective, uh, especially in New York, where we're doing work in a very unionized uh, community, and, and there's a lot of support from labor. Yeah. Matt, if, uh, if we in Georgia, I, I'd like your opinion on this, if we in Georgia did three things, allow those public schools that want to, to deregulate down to the level of private schools, to give parents uh, education savings accounts so they control the money and to make the testing simply a information, not a penalty. Do you think that would encourage more innovation? Uh, yeah, I do. I, you know, I think the savings accounts are a really interesting idea. I think like the voucher movement, the voucher struggle has been a supply side issue. We have not created market incentives for high quality providers and that's why the voucher movement has stalled. My issue with uh, ESAs is they're very similarly structured. There's not a good solution on the demand on the supply side, right? This is again just sort of a demand side economic theory and, and practice. So, in partnership with you know a, a new schools for Atlanta and a, and and investing from philanthropy in non-governmental agencies that are helping on the supply side to incubate providers and self-police the market of supply side on that equation. I think it'd be the one of the three that I'd pick. Well, I, I agree with you, but my reason for suggesting that is having dealt with public yeah. school folks, I don't blame them for not uh, being innovative because they have every incentive in the current system to avoid risk sure. and avoid Absolutely. failure. So That's right. It's very rational. And right again, this is not, school is not broken. People in the institutions are not evil. It's just an obsolete model. And they're, they're trying to kick that horse. That's what's happening. Uh, yeah. Can you say something about teacher preparation? Because I think that concept applies exactly to teacher preparation as being obsolete. Yeah. Or almost becoming even more standardized, except for small things like Teach for America that are overwhelmed by just the vanilla of colleges of education. Uh, I, I think fundamentally the only way, so the, de the devastating stat on teacher prep, and we're past the 15 mark, so full permission if you want to walk out, is that okay? Two more, two more and then we'll break and then we'll hang out if you want to hang out. 
Um, the bottom quartile of SAT takers is where we get our teachers as a nation. Right? This is a profession of last resort. The solution to teacher prep is make the profession more engaging. If you want to simplify it to don't test them, I'll fight you on that because I think that's a BS argument. I think the issue is that no one thinks that there's real innovation and room to be creative in the field. And that's why I think starting non-school startups is the way to do it because you can engage an existing teacher like Nicole and you can encourage new entrants into the field. That's why I bet on that as a PD solution. Uh, yeah, last one. How much have you improved parental involvement? Because a lot of what you yeah. see in Georgia is the low performing kids, a pretty strong correlation with the parents who are just not engaged, don't really care about their kids' education, mm -hmm. send them to school, it's the warehouse, or whatever. In New Orleans, have you seen uh, with the new model improvements in the program? Yeah, uh, uh, many of the school models in New Orleans now are not dependent on heavy parent engagement, and there's pretty interesting research that just came out saying that's flat. I'm, I'm skeptical of the way they did that work. Um, that's actually the next phase for us. So in the fall, I will probably run an incubator dedicated to parent-led micro-school and sort of you know homeschool on steroids efforts. Uh, I think that we've done very little, frankly, in New Orleans on that. So I don't think it's the reason we've been successful. I think it's the reason that we need to have behind going from C to A. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. without that, the middle class simply does that's not that's engage. That's and so I think sort of at a fundamental level, if you don't do that. Uh, you're not going to solve the big problem. <laughs> One more fast, go. My observation is that athletics plays a very big part of the schools in the state of Georgia at least. Yes. Do you provide basketball and football to the kids at the charter school? We do not, and we let the charter schools um, self-organize on that. So now ch kids in small charters get together on a team with kids from other small charters and they compete in the, in the leagues. And it turns out to be something we thought was going to be a big problem that worked itself out. If read and end Ripley's book, this is one of the most devastating facts about U.S. schools. Uh, international students are uh, amazed at how much value we put in sports. And everybody on the left of that graph where Korea is winning, sports is a much minor, uh, much less important issue in their schools. Re really interesting data there. I can't resist one more question. All right, one more, Dr. <laughs> Shoemaker, just for you. Yes, sir. How about charter schools for slow learning students? That's a great question. Um, so in, in some ways, what you're asking is a more specific question. In New Orleans, the district basically doesn't exist anymore, right? It is, a, it is a shell of itself. And there are still market needs for kids with special needs, kids high on the autism spectrum. Um, my belief is that the school district does play a role. They need to exist. And solving this gap analysis of saying, we need, so in New Orleans, we need schools like that. We need charter schools that, spe we need schools that specialize in serving kids with severe needs. The only way to do that is to, if the market doesn't present enough seats for someone to step up and say, I'm going to make money or survive by serving that population, then the district needs to provide, and they need to A, serve the community in the short term, and B, philanthropy needs to step up, which my partner Nero does right now. So he's creating incentive to say, district, run a school like that now, but I will create a market incentive for people to put that school up and get over the hump of having a few kids so that by the time you're serving enough kids in New Orleans with your special school, um, I will cover the, the cash flow and the financial viability risk from zero to two or three hundred. So my answer is you absolutely need them. You need a very diverse portfolio. And over time, it's this cycle of saying, what does the market need? And the charter market will provide that. And you need some stopgap measures in between to allow the supply side of the equation to catch up with the demand side. Please give a hand for Matt. Thank you for opening our minds. I, I still ask, why not Atlanta, why not Georgia? And uh, thank you for being with us. We've got some books here uh, from the Friedman Foundation. Thank you, Susan. Please grab a copy before you leave. And remember, May 7th, across the street at the Cobb Gallery Center. We're adjourned.